Hey everyone, welcome back to Tactical Magic. This is Molly Mandelberg, your host, and I'm here with a special guest today, Abigail Morgan Prout. One of the things we love talking about on this show are ways to up level in our businesses and in our lives. And one of the ways to do that, I think, is through creativity. And I feel very lucky and fortunate to have an expert on leadership and creativity here with us today. So we're going to be talking about poetry as a path to discover, reveal, expand, express your leadership. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Hang tight for just a sec. We'll be right back. It's not just about mastering technology. It's not just about brand or messaging. It's not just about making more money. It's about showing up in a big way so your people can find you. This is about bringing your most wild and authentic self into the hustle and grind. Welcome to Tactical Magic, a business strategies podcast for the warrior goddess entrepreneur. Awesome. So Abigail Morgan Prout is a passionate advocate for poetry as a medium of cultivating professional leadership, specializing in feminine forward leadership through online courses called Spiral Leadership and in-person retreats. She has worked with thousands of leaders throughout her 23-year career as a leadership coach. For the last 20 years, she has worked as a professional co-active coach and has spent the last seven years as faculty for the Co-Active Training Institute, facilitating their coaching and leadership courses, courses as and as a blogger. Welcome to the show, Abigail. Thank you so much, Molly. It's great to be here. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your journey. I mean, you've had a wildly long career compared to many coaches that are out there these days, but what was your path to finding this as your sort of journey? Well, coaching kind of hit me over the head. I was actually a therapist in my 20s and I was burning out pretty hard as a therapist and um, hired a coach, which uh, was not really a a valid profession yet. And so in the late 90s, I hired a coach and was so delighted by what she was doing with me that I thought, well, I could find out how to also create this magic with other clients. So um, I quickly shifted gears from therapy to coaching and the rest is history. I mean, I've just been so in love with the idea of bringing out the best in people and working with people towards their future selves for, you know, 20, 25 years. So powerful magic. And yeah, there's something about the journey to stepping into our leadership that is like, a very intense, sometimes alchemical process where the things that do not serve us come slap us in the face until we decide to finally let them go. Um, Yeah, I don't think people talk about that quite enough, really, is that, you know, choosing to be a leader, choosing to be a coach, choosing to step into that kind of facilitation is, um, it's a powerful personal growth journey in addition to running a business and mastering your skills and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in a way it's almost like that was one of the big enrollment pieces that had me step into being a coach because I knew that I would have to be constantly growing myself and I couldn't rest on my laurels. Having the value of, of, of personal growth and leadership in myself and knowing that I would be on the front lines. It's exciting. And it's, and it's exhausting because you have to keep reinventing yourself over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. And discovering who you are now as you keep growing. Yeah. So you have a very beautiful and uh, connected relationship with nature. Would you share a little bit about how that plays into what you do and how you work? Yeah. I grew up on a little island in the Pacific Northwest in the San Juan Islands. And I took it for granted that out of school experience was just kind of roaming around on my own and building forts and playing on beaches and in the forests and stuff. And then when I got out in the quote unquote real world as a professional, I realized how special that relationship with nature really was and how I, I had just assumed that it would be there for most people and be a resource for most people. And I realized pretty quickly that a lot of people haven't either had it or continued to nurture it as adults. And so for me, when I moved back here in my 30s, I'm back on the same island, and it was a real challenging thing to move back to my hometown. But the the thing that sealed the deal was my relationship with place and how much love and comfort and um, 
resourcefulness that I personally get from engaging and interacting with nature and offering that to my clients. So a lot of my clients come up and um, come to our little tiny retreat center up here on Lopez and, and engage with nature in a different way. So that's been, that's been a real wonderful thing to be able to offer. Yeah. I imagine it's a really grounding place to do that kind of deep work too. Yeah. And also, I mean, there's something about islands having access to um, being surrounded by the water and also, you know, the forests of the Pacific Northwest. I mean, there's just, there's a lot of deep roots and there's also a lot of currents. So you can really connect with the different elements um, pretty quickly. Yeah. I grew up in the Pacific Northwest too. So I do know what you're talking about. <laughs> yes. yes. Yeah. So you are bridging some really beautiful world worlds in your work, not just with nature and coaching, but with poetry and leadership. So will you tell us about the relationship between those things and how you're bringing that forward? I've been writing poetry for a long time, just kind of keeping it in my journals. And in the last maybe five years, I've started to share it out with people. And I find that the process of writing poetry, which is just a really essentialized and emotional uh, medium to kind of download what you're thinking and feeling, is a great way to find out, like to find your voice as a leader and to really um, have reflected back to you what's really going on for you on any certain topic. That has been a great practice for me as a you know, as someone who's dedicated to personal growth, but also to share with my clients. Not all my clients write poetry. It's not for everybody, but a lot of people, it kind of when you demystify it and you give yourself permission, it can be a really efficient way to get in touch with uh, your own truth. Awesome. So how does that work in the coaching relationship? Are you having people write poetry and then unpacking it with them or guiding them to write it in the first place? Yeah, it just depends on the client. I mean, some people come... Um, having never written a poem and um, some people come with, you know, experience writing for themselves and in journaling in different ways. And it's, it's kind of, um, I, I think a large part of it is giving oneself permission to a, you know, have the courage to write poetry and to call something a poem. It's um, that's in, in some way, that's a leadership move right there. And then to really listen to yourself and the wisdom that you're writing down to engage it and then and then share it with a with another person, I, a coach or a partner or a friend. It's very brave. It's vulnerable and it's brave and it can also reveal a lot about what's going on. And so it just depends on the person. Like I had a I had a client hire me. She was a lawyer and she hired me. She's, she'd never written a poem before in her life. And she didn't hire me as a, a coach who was going to help her write poetry. She just found out about that mm -hmm. as we started to work together. And um, so she developed the practice of just writing on, you know, whatever topic that she was working on in her trial um, cases. And she got to the point where she, she if she was having trouble um, moving a case forward, she would just sit down and write a poem about it. And she won this major national landmark case because she didn't know how to close out her closing statement for her jury. And so she just wrote a poem about it. And then she delivered the poem as her closing statement. And it was so emotional and so direct and to the point that the case was just completely flipped. Wow. And that is um, kind of an amazing testimony, but it also just kind of goes to the heart of the magic of the medium. Yeah, absolutely. And to be a lawyer in a high powered case like that, and to be willing to bring forward poetry as a compelling argument, like, wow, that gives me chills. That's so powerful. Yeah. And I was really surprised because I didn't give her that assignment. Like we didn't come up with it together. She was just so used to doing it. She gave it to herself. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So tell us more about how the poetry comes into I mean, that's an amazing example, but how poetry can be an avenue to step into more of our leadership. Well, I think um, anytime you're leading something, you have two jobs. One is as a visionary to offer something new, something that uh, perhaps you have a unique view on that is valuable to your constituents or your um, clientele. The other job that you have is to enroll people into that vision 
poetry can really help with both of those. It can help you articulate what you're seeing and feeling about something or, you know, create, you know, using words specifically to kind of build a possibility or a new world where there wasn't one before. And it can also emotionally really engage and, and speak to people who might not understand what you're trying to offer. And so for me, I often just give myself a topic or a theme to write on, like the topic of commitment or a relationship that I'm challenged with. And I'll just um, just download it into my journal and just write a bunch of stuff and then I'll turn it into a poem. And that will give me a lot of understanding about where I'm going and how to enroll perhaps other people to come with me. I love that. Yeah, there's something about the writing process that is revealing that it actually allows you to understand where you stand on something or how you feel about something or what you desire more of in a situation in a way that you might not cognitively just think your way there. There's something really, I mean, that's why I'm an everyday writer because I know that it helps me process those things in a deeper way and to do it through like the beauty of an artistic medium like poetry is um i think just even more powerful and i like what you said about the permission to call it a poem or to call yourself a poet i think there is like a oh i'm going to do this thing but like it's not really that thing i i used to have that judgment about being an artist it's like well you make art so you might as well call yourself an artist or my mother teaches writing and she says it doesn't matter if you write a day in your life that if you feel guilty about not writing, then you're a writer. And so then I say, <laughs> if you're if you are a writer by that definition, then you might as well write something. You might as well. I mean, if you're yeah. going to feel guilty about it, that like guilt serves no master, so you might as well do the thing. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, and and it's and it's interesting too because there is you know the same thing is true for leadership. Like for for a lot of people, calling themselves a leader of anything is an edge to cross. You know, we all need creative mediums and creative habits to help us, you know, craft what we're leading people into and why. So, you know, it definitely feels like, um, you know, for, for a lot of us, we know that creativity is a huge source of, of our leadership. And for a lot of people, it's hard to tap into. Yeah which is a great reason why to get support and also to seek inspiration for that kind of. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, like, um, you know, poetry is having kind of a a renaissance. I mean, if you look at in history, you can see there many, many leaders have been poets. And and actually um, there was this um, thing where the Chinese um, dynasty, you had to be trained in poetry to, to take over. And, and you can see that in a lot of different um, nationalities that poetry has played a huge role in, in politics. And um, I'll never forget when Amanda Gorman stepped up to the podium at the inauguration of Joe Biden, there was just this kind of like, what, you know, what's happening? Like there's a, there's a young poet laureate at, at the mic, like taking the mic and leading the nation into an exercise of emotion and imagination. And um, David White, who's a, who's a well-known poet, says that poetry is a language mm-hmm. to which we have no defenses. And I was watching, I was watching the inauguration with my children, and, and I was looking at their faces when she was reciting her poem, and they were just like dumbstruck. And you could tell that their imaginations were fired up, but they, they were completely undone um, by it. Like they had no defense for what was happening. And I think that that's, that's the power of, of, a, of a good poem is it makes you feel things that you weren't prepared to feel. Yeah. And sometimes things you didn't know you could feel or that you already were feeling. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Revealing. Yeah. I love that. So your uh, book is out. Tell us about Walk Deep. Yeah. So Walk Deep um, came actually from a coaching challenge that I received as a client um, to write a poem a day for a month. And I received this about a week before COVID hit. And I was like, oh, sure, I can, I can challenge myself to do that. And then I started writing a poem a day and then COVID hit. And then I had a lot to write about. <laughs> and 
and everything seemed to slow down. And so I take this walk every morning in the woods with my dog and it's about a three mile loop around this hill. And I started doing this walking meditation every day. And then I would come home and write a poem on whatever I had been thinking about. And it became this practice that I did for a year, um, give or take 12 months. And then I had a bunch, like a body of work. I started sending out these poems to a group that I called Viral Poetry and, and getting feedback. And the list started growing. And I started to realize that people really were hungry for a conversation that was um, more abstract and more beautiful and more emotional. Um, and so I had this body of work and I entered a contest. I'd never submitted uh, a poem anywhere before. And I um, entered a contest called the Homebound Poetry Contest and I won and they published my book. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was pretty exciting. Amazing. I love yeah. that. Congratulations on winning that and also Thanks. on getting your book published. And um, I think there's something really powerful about being in that practice, being in that daily life of especially I think all of us had like a weird reality check when COVID happened. Um, but to use some of that in between space, in between time that instead of scrolling or instead of watching the news or whatever that you are willing to like commit a little part of your day to expression to to first grounding in nature and then expressing some part yeah and it you know it i also to be totally honest with you i i um i went into a, a state of kind of um i got a little paralyzed with my work at that time and i started to question like god what do i have to offer you know that kind of like you know saboteur kind of thinking and i thought you know what the main thing that i have to offer right now is integrity to myself and so if I can walk my talk and do the thing that I'm encouraging other people to do, which is connect and attune to nature and to really be in a dialogue where we're listening a lot more than, you know, speaking in nature, and then um, to download and create from what we're getting, whether, you know, no matter what your medium. And, um, and so I, I took that challenge on because I thought, you know, this is something that I have done with this business, but I have never done it as a practice for my own creativity. And so when I took that challenge on and followed through on it, there was something really magical that happened because I felt like I was really giving myself the time to, to really listen to nature and to really um, listen to my own nature. And to uh, create from that. Beautiful. Yeah. So I imagine some people are listening to this and getting fired up. I personally was a poet starting. My first poem got published at nine years old about my cat in a magazine. I had an edge because my mom was used to getting things published and probably knew the person running the magazine. But um, poetry was my first right, like deep love of creativity and art. Um, and I'm sure there are people out there listening who are feeling fired up a maybe about writing poetry, but also about being guided by a coach who is coming from the places that you're coming from. I can even think of a couple people who I already know I need to connect you with because they're just like minded souls. But who do you generally work with? What's a great um, who's a great candidate to be a client of yours? What what do you specialize in with? You know, I typically attract um, kind of high powered women who have experienced a level of success in the quote unquote man's world, but are really wanting to uh, open up to their creativity and their femininity and trust their voice. Um, and to find out what's theirs to create, whether that's a book or whether that's, um, poetry or whether that's painting or whether that's a new business or whether that's, you know, it, there's just so many different ways that creativity can blossom. And, um, you know, my, my work as an, I, so part of my therapy background was as an art therapist. I have my MFCC and art therapy combined. And I've always just been a uh, huge proponent for having our creativity give us information about how we're growing, but also about what needs to be born in the world. And so I think the people that I most 
that, that do best with me are evolutionarily minded, like people who are really invested in their personal growth and also excited about doing it in a way that's fun and creative and um, perhaps surprising. I love that. And you also have um, programs and retreats with your spiral leadership stuff. Tell us a little bit about spiral leadership too. Well, spiral leadership was um, really born from my my work as a coactive coach. And I really, uh, which is um, the Coactive Training Institute is one of the largest coaches training programs in the world. And as a faculty member for them, and I was on their um, uh, faculty team development for a while. And I realized that I really cared a lot about bringing more of our relationship with nature and spirituality into the conversation of leadership. And that was actually where I wanted to play. And um, it was a little too woo woo for that, you know, for that clientele or that kind of industry. Um, And so I kind of broke off and started my own, uh, feminine forward kind of nature-based leadership program. Awesome. Yeah. And it's based on, I mean, it's pretty basic, but it's also like this happened maybe six years ago. So at that time it was, there wasn't a lot of feminine leadership conversation. It was kind of like cutting edge. And the idea behind it is that I got really inspired by, um, I've always been kind of a geek when it comes to nature's patterns. So um, the spiral is obviously a really powerful um, shape and evocative of, of a really certain way of growing. And so what I did was looked at the spiral and broke it down into different phases of growth. Um, and so when it's, it's called spiral leadership because it's based on um, the form of the spiral and the way that a spiral actually grows is fascinating. Yeah. Um, like a shell and how a shell grows. And so I just kind of, uh, with a bow to, to nature, really started looking at like, how do we do that same thing in our own uh, development as, as women leaders? And not just women, but um, feminine forward, you know, thinkers and leaders. Yeah, it used to just it's funny, because I have to catch myself, it used to just be women. And then I, I realized that that was really sexist. And so I really had broken open the the idea that and it's not this is this is not work just for women um and i mostly attract women yeah or very forward forward thinking men yeah same yeah. me too yeah i love that awesome you're uh just wild and amazing inspiration and i want to thank you already for inspiring the poetry that i intend to go um write in bed tonight <laughs> Right and also for all the people that you're supporting to bring that that creative self-expression and also that like radical self-discovery that can come through it. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that and um, can't wait to read your book. I haven't got my copy yet, but I'm going to go check it out. And anyone out there who's listening, it's called Walk Deep by Abigail Prout. You can go to abigailprout.com. What are some of the best ways for people to connect with you or follow up with you? Um, there's a space on my, um, website to sign up for a poem a week. Um, so that they can do it that way. They can, um, contact me through spiral leadership, um, spiral dash leadership.com and just get on the mailing list and find out what's happening with that. Or they can just contact me directly, um, through either one of those websites to have a chat. You know, I, I truly believe that, um, our evolution depends so much on our courage to create and we're so much better creating with each other and um and we need to support each other so you know i've got coaches and you know groups that i'm a part of and writing circles and i just got back i said i was telling you before molly i just got back from the omega institute where i was studying poetry um, with padraig otum who's an amazing irish poet for a week um Get, giving yourself permission to be your creative genius. That's, that's what we're here for. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Abigail. And thank you everyone out there for listening. Um, we'll put the link to uh, Abigail's coaching and also her personal website with her book on it 
on the show notes of this episode. Any last words of wisdom you want to leave people with? No, just um, trust your dreams and share them. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much, Molly. Yeah, thank you so much for being on the show. And whatever happens, everyone, keep asking big questions and taking bold action because you are here for a reason. Bye.